1 Peter 3.15 reads, In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. This verse is often used to spur Christians on to the task of apologetics, because all too often, many Christians don't have an answer and would buckle immediately under the weight of any informed scrutiny. Hell, most of them don't even read their own holy book. If you're a Christian watching this, is it any wonder why so many people have a hard time taking you guys seriously? Well, hopefully you want to be taken seriously, and I'm here to help. I can help you be a better Christian. This is actually not a trap. I mean, not completely. Yes, I'm going to give an opinionated overview of some things and explain ways in which I disagree with you. This is the incentive for the atheists who stick around, by the way. And yes, I am a filthy skeptic. But I'd like to think there's something here for everyone. Also, I'm going to be primarily addressing this to Christians who are already interested in apologetics and hopefully philosophy, so there's going to be substance here. But I'll still do my best to make it as accessible as I can. To start, what if I told you that millions of Christians are overlooking some major tensions within their beliefs? Tensions that they haven't even thought about. It's not really that surprising that something like this could be the case, as people fail to think deeply about the potential inconsistencies in their beliefs all the time. And I'm sure this will be easy for you to see when thinking about a politician or political party you strongly disagree with. Inconsistent beliefs are bad, though. I think we can agree, and we shouldn't want them. So my main word of advice, Christians, is to think through the tensions. Seriously consider that you may have some beliefs that don't naturally fit well together, or may just be plain inconsistent. If you're going to destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, in the words of 2 Corinthians 10, you should have an interest in doing so. Well, what happens when a baby dies? That's a bit of an abrupt transition, I guess. But really, what happens? Among Christians, the answers diverge. Some claim that we can't know that they don't wake up to eternal conscious torment. Yes, I can prove that. The Reformed tradition holds that, quote, elect infants dying in infancy are regenerated and saved by Christ through the Spirit, who worketh when and where and how he pleaseth, unquote. This clearly means what it appears to mean. As Chad Van Dixhorn, an expert on the minutes of the Westminster Assembly, writes, quote, Often there is a tendency to drop the qualifying word elect from the word infants with the suggestion that all babies go to heaven. The scriptures do not allow us to draw this conclusion. Apparent innocence does not rise to the height of an internal entitlement. Second, the confession is not saying that infants and the mentally handicapped are saved or elected because they are infants or because they are handicapped. Unquote. It follows that, quote, if one were to be elect on the basis of foreseen faith or obedience, what parents could have hope for their dying baby or for their aging but mentally inhibited child? Unquote. Don't miss what he is saying here. The reason that election is good news for many Christians is because without it, it is right for children dying in infancy to wake up for the first time to eternal conscious torment. To wake up to millions and millions of unending ages of the omnipotent floodgates of the fierce wrath of God that is vastly disproportionate to an individual's strength to bear. After all, the only precedent in the Reformed tradition is to offer hope to Christian parents that their children dying in infancy are part of the elect group of infants. See the Canons of Dort, the first main point of doctrine, Article 17. Even if you don't think God actually does that, if your system entails that it would be fair if he did, your ideas are bad, and you should feel bad. But if you don't have unhinged views like that as a Christian, you probably think all babies go to heaven when they die. They wake up in the presence of infinite divine love and are welcomed into eternal bliss. This is a comforting thought, and maybe we should even extend this to zygotes, right? An uncountable number of you extend personhood to zygotes for no good reason, so why not? Anyway, if you do, have you not seen how this creates a lot of trouble for your views? Think about how many pregnancies don't go to term for one reason or another. The numbers are actually staggering. Somewhere around half of fertilized eggs don't go to term. Add to that the massive number of young children who have died throughout evolutionary history, and heaven is going to be populated mostly by people, quote, who never develop personalities, have no memories, 
know nothing of love or loss or failure or ecstasy or regret or even redemption, and will have no experience of this life whatsoever." Unquote. But I'm sure God will zap all those people to the mature age of 30, right? Leaving that aside, let's zoom in here. If it's fine for people to wake up in God's ever-loving presence without the opportunity to choose the worst kinds of evils imaginable, or build their character in a place where people do, why is the world like this? It seems like Christians are overplaying their hand if their entire solution to the problem of suffering is to say that such opportunities are the greatest thing ever, and yet most people don't in fact get to have them. Put another way, if free will and soul building, in the kind of context we find ourselves in, are as valuable as people claimed, it would be surprising for a massive portion of heaven's population to essentially wake up there. Surprising for a loving God to withhold the opportunity for vast swaths of creatures to grow in extremely valuable ways. This would be exactly what we would expect, however, if it's not as valuable as claimed. Here's the problem. Those who doubt the reality of a perfectly loving God point out that this is not the kind of world we would expect such a being to create. One rejoinder is that free will and soul building in this kind of context represent extremely valuable ways for us to grow and flourish as persons, and are uniquely valuable out of all the ways we could have potentially done so. That is why God puts up with the worst kinds of evils imaginable. But if your own commitments entail or at least strongly suggest that free will and soul building aren't as valuable to God as you are claiming, then you've got a problem because you're cutting off the branch you're sitting on when it comes to responding to the problem of evil. But we're not done, as there's tensions galore in how Christians respond to suffering. According to Christian scholar Peter Van Inwagen, Jews, Christians, and Muslims insist that whether God creates a world, that is, whether he creates anything, is a matter of his free choice. Nothing in his nature compels him to create, he is not, for example, compelled to create by his moral perfection, for it is not better that there should be created things than that there should be no created things. It could not be better, for all goods are already contained, full and perfect and complete, in God. As I've said elsewhere, what this means is that, for the theist then, the greatest goods must be contained in and modeled by God. And this is so, all without the presence or possibility of evil. Another way to say this is that the greatest goods just are pure goods. Goods that exist without the presence or possibility of being corrupted by evil. Schellenberg explains, Every worldly good that permits or requires evil is greatly exceeded by a pure good of the same type existing in God prior to creation. This is interesting. What it forces us to notice and take seriously is that since, say, instances of courage and compassion presuppose evil or its permission, these goods cannot exist in God prior to creation, and yet God is then unsurpassably great. Let me put this slightly differently. According to traditional theism, God embodies the greatest goods there are prior to creation without evil. This entails, or at least strongly suggests, that any world modeling those goods, whether it be only God or some variation of God and creatures with no evil, would be at least as good, if not better, than any world with evil. Given this fact, and given the fact that God is supposed to be a perfectly loving being, it shouldn't be that hard to rule out the possibility that such a being would actualize a world with Auschwitz. And before anyone objects, that this would obliterate free will or love or something? No, it wouldn't. I covered that in a video that I'll link in the description. But suppose we set this aside. Suppose you're a theist that thinks the greatest goods there are are not contained in God, and they can't be realized without a world like ours. Fair enough, if you're willing to commit yourself to a position that flies in the face of traditional theism, plausibly necessitates a creation, and implies a troubling incompleteness in God, you're free to do so. But even if you do this, it's not clear how much it helps. Let's say courage and compassion in the face of horrific evil and suffering are amazing goods. Even if so, it doesn't follow that any situation whatever that creates an opportunity for their actualization is worthwhile or even permissible. Philip Goff gives a thought experiment wherein a bystander, himself in this scenario, saves a baby from a burning building, only to realize the entire situation was manufactured for a television game show called Who Dares. He writes, quote, No doubt I displayed great skill and courage in the rescue, 
And if the child's life really was in danger, then I managed to prevent a tragedy. But there is something perverse about a world in which lives are put in danger just for the sake of facilitating daring rescues. The whole thing is reminiscent of the brilliant but terrifying Korean drama Squid Game, in which contestants risk their lives in lethal games of chance and skill. Even if courage and compassion are great goods, it is immoral to endanger people merely for the sake of allowing others to show courage and compassion." Unquote. There's more that could be said about this, of course, but it's not at all clear that theodicies that sacrifice us like pawns in a cosmic chess game for the sake of actualizing abstract ontological goods really have anything going for them. To summarize, Christians in the apologetic sphere need to do better if they want informed skeptics to take them seriously. To be fair, some of you have thought about these things, but many haven't, and wield a tangled web of beliefs that don't fit well together. So either get rid of the beliefs or get back to the drawing board. That may be hard to do in a theistic framework if you're still a Christian, though. So tap this video next to me to see why Christianity almost certainly is not true.